students current and we hope students to come, students of the future. Um, um, Provost, I almost made you president, Provost Bell and uh, faculty members of Barnard College. I have the most extraordinary honor today to introduce you to someone. Let me begin by reading a poem by South African poet Ingrid de Kock. It's called Women and Children First. It's always been so, this makes it worst, women and children first. First to be hurt, last to be nursed, it's always been so. When rumor stalks, first to be cursed and worse, turned out, inside out, only safe in the hearse, women and children first. But of course, first too in their refusal to let this go unchecked, unnoticed and unaddressed, first to act are women like Labour Bowie. Barnard College and especially Barnard Africana Department, the newly elevated department, are honoured and excited to have Lema Bowie, peace activist, Nobel laureate, social worker, educator, mother, join us. She is our inaugural distinguished fellow in social justice. She is a woman who has added her voice not only to her own nation, Liberia's conscience, but to the world's. And this is whether she is arguing at the UN to have rape made a war crime in Libya or to help re-socialize former child soldiers. She is a relentless campaigner against the excuse of ethnic difference as a cause for strife. Lema Gaboi's multinational efforts to empower women and to bring peace to their countries absolutely complements Barnard's commitment to international and global programming without ever forgetting the relation between the local and the international. She is a visionary woman who demands peace not only in Liberia but elsewhere. I can stand here and go on. I can tell you about her Liberation Mass Action for Peace, which is a coalition of Christian and Muslim, Muslim women who sat in protest in Liberia against a ruthless president and rebel warlords and who even held a sex strike. I can tell you about the woman who has emerged as this international leader who is changing and has already changed history. And I can tell you about her insistence on reconciliation. But I really urge you to listen to her today, to read her memoir, Mighty Be Our Powers, and to see the documentary, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. At our commencement speech this year, Lehman Bowie, I said I was going to quote her and she said, no, I am. <laughs> Lehman Bowie, she began by saying that she'd been told, and I quote, that American kids are born with whistles in their bellies. Let us make that joyful noise and welcome her. Thank you so much. Um, I took this route because when I fall, I can really fall. <laughs> so I was a little bit afraid um, to come up and really do the stage falling. <laughs> I want to say thank you to President Spa, Provost Bell, faculty and staff of Barnard College for making my time just the beginning of getting into the academia world comfortable. You all have really been helpful and you've really made me to feel like this is where I should be. To the family and friends here, I'm deeply honored that you've chosen to spend your afternoon listening to me instead of listening to the gist about the food in the dining hall <laughs> and the roommate and all of the different things. I usually start by saying this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm humbled and honored by this invitation I recently joined the Barnard family and 
I've said many times before that coming to Barnard is a welcome opportunity for me to slow my pace. I doubt if I've slowed down. <laughs> but what I do know is that it's helped me really learn my four-year-old. A few days ago, I woke up and called my sister. I said, Father, I think there's something wrong with the baby. And she said, what? I said, she grind her teeth all night. And she said, oh my God, you just knowing that your child grinds her teeth? <laughs> I said, I've never heard it before. She said, let's put it, the conversation in a reverse. You haven't slept with her in your bed for a long time. So this is really a time for me, not just to slow down and reflect upon the triumphs and challenges facing women and girls, but most importantly, to engage and listen to students. The nature of my work is like putting out fires and finding ways of avoiding future fires using local knowledge and skills. This is what the Barnard experience affords me. A safe space to plan a course of action that will help all of us, myself, yourself inclusive, reset our world for the better. That prescription is spelled out in the school's motto, following the way of reason. This motto made me pause it is a simply stated mandate. It's easy to follow, but a very challenging path to forge, following the way of reason. Global conflicts and wars have taken over our world. Death and destruction are the orders of the day. Many of the global crises are difficult to understand. If you find myself, yourself in my world and some of the places that I've been, you will wonder if there is anything like a tomorrow. I was in Libya a few months back, engaging with young people. And as we sat in a room talking from one, talk, converse, having conversation one after the other, I asked them, what visions they had for their lives in the next five years. A room of over 40 young men. And one boy raised his hand and I had this big smile because I expected him to outline where he would be in five years. And then he said to me, Madam Bowie, you asked for five years. I don't even know where I'll be in the next 24 hours. I can't see beyond today. And we spent the next 30 minutes, me trying to push them. Because I said to them, if you do not have a vision for your life, their, your ability to want to move forward will be difficult. So let's dream together. Where do you see yourself? And still, no one. And one of the women who was the facilitator of the group who, have moved, who had moved back from Italy, so Libya started this very beautiful reconciliation initiative called the Libyan Initiative. Her son, 12, 13, was in the room. He raised his hand. And I said to him, yes, where do you see yourself? This is a repat Libyan. He had been repatriated back home. So you would think that after living in, in Europe, he has a plan. And he said, in five years, He's going to be 17 or 18. I see myself as a military man. His mother froze, and she just sat there looking. And he had this big grin. He said, I want to join the military to continue to liberate my people. So you, you go in my part of the world, you see different things that rape a four-year-old, nine-month-old babies old people being destroyed. We, in the same Libyan initiative that we find ourselves working on, men and old men testify of being raped and abused by other men during the Civil War. You, you wonder within yourself, where are we going? It's difficult to understand the global crisis because now, as it is, 
they are based on no sensible ideology. Jeffrey Jitterman wrote an article describing the conflicts in Africa as no longer wars in the traditional sense. He calls them on wars. They lack plans, they lack ideologies, they have no clear goals. They care less about taking capital cities. Instead, they prefer the butchers, where it's easy to commit mayhem and kill and rape and meme, and if I may add, with impunity. When the founding fathers and mothers of Africa fought for Africa's liberation and Africa tomorrow, they had a plan. Collectively, they said the people will benefit. When the pioneers of the US and the West, the other Western countries, thought about establishing states, they all had plans. And the plan was that we're going to establish nations that will cater to the needs of their people. What we see today is a decline, not just in the classic African liberation movement, but a decline in the global liberation movement and the emergence of something new, something wild, messier, and in most instances, a little bit more violent. The lack of true leaders in national politics is a global challenge. We see political alliances overshadowing interests. For the fourth time in five years, a major prize given to African leaders who have left office and done exceptionally has been given to no leader because they could not find one leader on our continent after they've left office who deserves the prize. And I'm talking about the Mo Ibrahim Prize. It's, it's usually awarded to leaders who have done good governance and all of these things. We haven't seen it in the last two years. And it's been, it, this is like the fifth time. A board member said in a press conference that if the prices were for European heads of state, they wouldn't necessarily find winners every year also. The lack of true leaders extends even to the United States, this great country. <laughs> the, the recent government shutdown is a clear example of our national leaders failing to reason for the common good of the people. Most of our leaders and in most of the nations around the world is ego, self-interest that drive the national politics. It is my way or no other way. That's the tune the rest of the population has to dance to. Our world, simply put, has lost its ability to follow the way of reason. And this is something we find in our young people. You go into communities and you see some of the things that young people do and you ask yourself, did you really sit down to think this true? I am one person who's been mentoring girls in Liberia, and I usually give my phone numbers regardless of where I find myself. If you're in crisis, call me. And this afternoon, one of the brightest of the girls called me, and she said, this is a difficult conversation to have. I said, what's going on? And then she said, P-R-E-G-N-A-N-T. And I said, sorry, but I did not hear that spelling. Go over it again, because I think I only heard G and T. So she went over the spelling. And then I said to her, the typical African in me, is this someone you intend to marry? And she said, no, this is just my friend. So I said, so what happened? You were just in the mood and you went? And she said, why are you acting like a mother? I thought you were my friend. I say, okay, I rewind the conversation, put this tape on pause, and get it in your head. I'm not your friend. I'm your mentor. I'm your mother. If you see me that way, and I'm the person who have made a lot of mistakes, and I want you 
to follow true reason with me. Help me to understand you. And we had this long conversation at the end of the day was like, can you tell my mother for me? Because she'll be so disappointed. I said, I can't do that. I can encourage you to do so. In a room full of young men, I've told this story over and over with my staff in Monrovia. And we usually ask, let me see the hands of all the teen mothers in the room. But this time, I switch it around. And say, so let me see the hands of all the teen fathers. 40 out of 60 raised their hands. And then I walk up to them and say, hey, what happened? And then one said, I don't know. <laughs> what happened? The other one said, and it wasn't even pleasurable. What happened? It was just one minute. What happened? I pulled out, Madam Bowie. I asked what happened, and you've just given me excuses. No one is telling me what really happened. Because I was waiting to hear I had unprotected sex. From youth in Africa to youth in the US, I have a lot of white nieces. You know, when you are an activist, you adopt the children of other activists. So I have white nieces here. My kids said to me once, wow, we've called everyone in this world auntie, including Gloria Steiner. <laughs> so once you're a fellow feminist and activist, you enter my home, they will baptize you, auntie, to my children. And I've seen my nieces in this culture struggle. Try, I try to find reason. I try to help them find reason with the hookup culture. I try to help, to, I, I, I try to wrap my old head around why do you have to play dumb to get a boyfriend? Because if he's dumb, he's dumb. There's nothing you're going to do in your entire life that will help him. <laughs> We've lost our ability in this world to follow the way of reason. And I tell people the state of a home or the state of adults globally or the crisis our children find themselves in is a reflection of the states of the adults in the world. We're chasing everything, and we're getting nothing. We've lost our ability to reason. Recently, I was in Mozambique, and I had the opportunity of sitting with the Archbishop of the Anglican Church, who happened to be my godfather for the ceremony that I was in Mozambique for. And then we started talking again about the state of the world. This is one man who used all of his young energy to, to, to help bring an end to the Mozambican war. And Bishop Sangolani and I sat with his wife and my partner, Jay, and we just talked about the state of the world. And he said, Lima, let me tell you this story. So you know there is this old myth that humans came from monkeys. And so the monkeys had a congress. And at their Congress, they said, something is happening in this world. Men that they say are our descendants have lost it. <laughs> and someone say, how? Say, well, how can they be from us? Have you ever seen a male monkey beat his pregnant wife? Have you ever seen a male monkey go to a party and eat while his wife and children are at home hungry? Have you ever seen a male monkey take gun and butcher all of his relatives? We must take action, and we must disown them because they are no longer ours. We laugh and laugh and laugh after Bishop Sangolani told the story, but then afterwards, we all became very sober because there's a lot of truth in it. A few months back in Ghana, this hunter decided to wake up, woke up in the morning and could not find her dog. So she went around the neighborhood, they look all around. And finally, as they walk, move their way back from the community, under a bridge, they saw the dog perched. And they kept calling him, calling him, he would not budge. 
So someone decided to go closer and they got closer. This dog had wandered away from the owner's house into the bush and saw a day old baby that had been abandoned and lie over that baby to keep the baby warm. So if humans who are supposed to be the ones with reasons are abandoning babies, no wonder even the monkeys are having Congress to disown us. <laughs> but to put all of this in a nutshell, we've lost our way of reasoning. And you know, sometimes you sit and think and ask yourself, so what is the way to reason? To follow the way to reason is to follow the way to peace and social justice. Mm -hmm. To follow the way of reason is to follow the way of speaking truth to power and undoing the status quo for the collective benefit of all. To follow the way of reason is to help community, those communities that see abnormal as normal to reverse back. In preparing my remarks today, I read about the history of, and the founding of Barnard, the strongest opponent to the inclusion of women at Columbia College. The dean and faculty of political science argued that women would be a distraction to men and that our reproductive organs drain all of our energies needed for mental development, <laughs> a proposition that was supported then by Harvard University scholarship. This argument followed a prevailing way of the 19th century science. Mm -hmm. That was the way of reasoning. We were a distraction to the world. But a group of young women campaigned fiercely for the right of women to attend the university. And incredibly, Barnard College was born. Its supporters, visionaries, followed the way of reasoning that our intellectual capacity will rival that of men when given the space and opportunity to develop it. So you're, you don't have it. The way of reason is often so obvious in hindsight that the arguments that once discouraged it seems laughable. Though deceptively obvious, the way of reason is most times difficult to discern. In my work, there are many frustrations and sometimes I just rant by myself. <laughs> and other times I do it. A few days ago, Hafiza and I, my assistant, were sitting in my apartment, we're having a conversation, I was ready to go on. And I turned to my four-year-old and said, Nekopi, close your ears. And she turned back to me and said, my ears are open. <laughs> but the frustration, and sometimes I think that what drives my work is the path of reason. My work focuses on conflict resolution, education, such as, and health, such as women seated at the decision table during peace building processes or during negotiations to bring peace, access to quality and affordable education at all levels, the protection of sexual and reproductive health of women. These issues continue to be debated with opponents arguing that their science, their religion, or culture should lead the way to deny the rights of others. Yet it is reason that detects that those most affected in conflict should have a seat at the table, that every individual should have autonomy over their own body, and all should be able to pursue their intellectual interest. I take comfort that one day, because of our collective power and intervention, the world will follow the path to reason. We will look back at today's argument that a woman is not supposed to be in control of her own body, that women, because they do not fight wars, should not be at the peace table, that communities like the ones in Libya will not recognize and acknowledge that rape happened in May of this year when I went to Tripoli in a room filled with the President, Supreme Court Justice, Vice President, Prime Ministers, no one dare mention the word rape. Everyone said something horrible happened until I climbed up on the podium. <laughs> because I was asked to speak to the women of Libya on their role of rebuilding the nation, and I walked into a room of over 200 men and less than 10 women. 
And so I told them I've been asked to deliver this paper to women, but because there are 98.2% men in the room, I have to change what I have to say. And I have three things to say to the men of Libya. But in a nutshell, I was asking them, if you truly think Gaddafi was an evil ruler, and you came to undo everything that he did, history will judge you by the way you treat women. History will judge you if you do not, in essence, follow the way of reason and acknowledge that rape happened in this country. History will judge you. So we continue to fight. This is a huge fight globally. Everywhere you go, in some communities we go to, people tell you you can't give the women birth control because you're going to make them useless women. They will be promiscuous. They will start having affairs as if. You go to some other communities and you have to argue for the rights of girls that have gone from kindergarten to sixth grade to start from seventh to, to ninth grade. And these girls have to justify to their parents that I promise you I'm not going to get pregnant. I promise you that I just want to be somebody. I promise you that I will do this. But most times, people fail to see the way of reason. And persistently and constantly, I'm one of those people who get so frustrated that it's not easy to even think, look beyond. So something, and one of the things that I know about the Nobel Peace Prize, you are supposed to act. And so where before I would be an activist, sometimes I have to be a diplomat. <laughs> and then being a diplomat means looking Banky Moon in the eye and saying to him, sir, you will make sure that there is no drone strike in Syria. And your eye is picking the rage because the world has lost the sense of reasoning. The sense of reasoning is to bring people to the table where they can talk with each other and not at each other. Following the way of reasoning is encouraging our young people in communities not to stoop low because they have to hook up. Following the way of reasoning is men being able to, st or men being able to step up to the plate and speak to young men about their reproductive organ. Mm -hmm. When I had that conversation with those boys, as crazy and stupid as their answer to my question was, it dawned on me that in their entire lives, no one has sat them down to tell them one second of unprotected sex can impregnate a young woman. Following the way of reason is for us to start to treat each other with respect. My hair wrap and my dress does not necessarily mean I want to come and stay in the US. Trust me, I've been here three months, I want to go back. <laughs> because in Africa, we have all of the help to take care of that four-year-old. Yeah, we're stuck in that house together. <laughs> and I'm learning that she's so much like me that I can't stand myself. <laughs> Okay, 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 just forget it. And then I'll be like, really? Um, you know what, I think I, I'm talking to you now, you need to stop looking at that computer and be like, <laughs> But to follow the way of reason is to work for the collective good of people. To follow the way of reason in this country November 5th, you go to elections, is to put aside your political affiliation and vote people who have the interests of real people and not institutions. To follow the way of reason is to continue to walk peacefully. To follow the way of reason is to have tons of victories without losers. That's another topic for another day. As we endeavor to follow the way of reason, let us strive to do it at home with our children, 
Let's try to do it at school as instructors. Let's do it nationally. Let's insist that the way of reason is that way that will do good by everyone. May we follow the way of reason. Like the founders of Barnard, a way of reason may not be popular in today's age and politics. But you know, when you follow the way of reason and follow it from your conscience, there is a feel good about that way of reason. And if we follow the way of reason, the way the world is expected to be, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we all will look back and see a generation of young people that we will be proud of. Because they, too, will be walking in the way of reason. I thank you. questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I, uh, I saw the documentary Play, uh, Pray the Devil Back to Hell um, and your bravery was you and the other women were just awesome and unbelievable and way beyond the way of reason. Um, I think the world can't thank you enough. What's going on there now? Well, aside from being at Barnard, I am involved, like you heard, with Libya. Um, Libya is the first Arab country to have drafted a law that makes rape a war crimes. And we've, we've really been working and pushing to get that law passed. There were two laws, the transitional justice law and the rape law. Fortunately for us, just before the um, General Assembly, they passed the transitional justice law. The rape law, every other important body that should vote yes has voted yes and is now with some council. So we're really pushing to get that because not just recognizing rape, but also ensuring that those who have been raped will receive the same comp compensation that those who were kept in Gaddafi prisons for 30, 20 years would receive. That, but if you talk to a lot of the victims, what they're looking for is public acknowledgement that this thing happened here, not necessarily the benefits. So passing that law would mean finally one nation in the Arab world, in Africa, will be acknowledging that this heinous crime took place. Beyond that, um, we started a foundation when I won the prize, and we're doing education and leadership for young girls. So we currently have close to 70 people on scholarship. Um, we also got, we talked to universities, including Barnard. They've graciously given us some um, two scholarships for four years for girls. This is um, something that is new to me. Education is a new um, journey that I'm taking, but it's also very interesting because as we find scholarship for the girls, we're also identifying the structural gap in our educational system in Africa. And so over the last few months, I've been using my voice, calling for reform in our curriculum and the different things. Because for, for example, in Liberia, why do we want to, to read about the history of the American people founding America? You know, it has nothing to do with the current reality. So we're asking for reform the education 
and let it be relevant to today's reality. You need to look at the history and do it again so that when you're teaching young people, the idea of teaching history is that some of the things that happened in the past will not be repeated. Um, in my native language, they say in order to braid a new mat, you have to look at the old one. So if you keep teaching us history in the 1820s and the ones that happened in the 1990s are not being taught, what good is it for the young people? So education is another path. Um, recently, we've been asked to journey with the women of Syria. We haven't said yes yet because it's, my whole heart wants to do it, and I think I'm going to do it. I think we just agreed today that yes, we're definitely going to do it. Um, the dates are very fluid. There is a Geneva talk, Hafiza, correct me if I'm wrong. And there is a Lebanon preparatory meeting that they want me to go in. Um, I continue to follow the voice of God because I feel like I'm doing his work. Being here is a great thing, working with young people, listening to them. Um, I had my first class. I went crazy preparing for it. <laughs> Because I, I said to myself, Lord, if I go and tell those children something that I will be quoted for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, it, but it was a good experience for me. So I, I, I continue to do what I know to do best, and that's peace activism. And I think there's no way that we can talk peace and talk sustainable peace without speaking education and quality education for, for people. So that's, that's, that's the journey that I find myself on, aside from being mother of six children. Yes, sir. Out of that in many ways because it was where the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that very uh, extraordinary body, um, was formed uh, at the end of apartheid. But in South Africa, they have this extraordinary problem with rape. Uh, and um, I wondered, as part of the work that you do in the world, whether that may one day be a priority for you, to, to pass the kind of law in South Africa that you're talking about in Libya. Well, you know, most of the time when we look at the work that we do, I'm part of something called the African Feminist Forum. And this is a space that brings all of us who do different kinds of activism together to share our work. And the problem of South Africa, rape and abuse, is always a key agenda item when we meet. One of the things that I know, if you look at East and Southern Africa, the women there have a very strong um, ability to put policy on paper. But the ability to mobilize you know, for change, they really do not have. Um, so, and then we have that ability to mobilize in West Africa. If you wanted women like this on the street, they're there. They won't ask you why, they will just be there. Just say women, we're here. <laughs> but our ability to put the policies and things together. So I think over the years, we've recognized that this is something that we need to do but to say that South Africa is short of um, people or laws that would prevent some of these issues, they do have those laws, but what we don't see is the political will to prosecute. A few months back, way back, I was in Grandstown in South Africa, and we were sitting as a group of educators talking about some of the issues of um, sex for grades and the exploitation of young people in schools. And one of the things that people from within the university and high school settings talk about was the protection of these perpetrators by the unions. They have very strong unions, so they cannot just go after these people without it being politicized. So I think one of the ways that, and if the government is truly serious, it will be going through some of these institutions that protect the perpetrators of these very serious crimes and get them. But sometimes you sit and ask yourself, why is this so horrible? Because one of the last stories I heard was the story of the girl who was gang raped by her brother's roommate in college, and she was open up the from her vagina straight up to her throat. But 
she lived long enough to identify the boys who did it to her. And so you, you ask yourself these questions. For Liberia, we have similar problems. Just two days ago, the, the report came out that the ages of the victims of rape in Liberia is dropping. It's now two, three, four, nine months old babies. And the question you're asking, we ask ourselves is, why is it like this? And sometimes you say when a country has been through a violent past, people do not really put a lot of money into the psychosocial healing of community. As long as we're building roads and bringing lights and bringing water, it's enough. But it is not enough until communities can go through some process of healing, some process of trauma counseling. It builds up, it grows, it grows and grows. I've been working with a group of ex-child soldiers, and these young boys have grown into men. They are having children, are there to go into their compounds, and people will be screaming when I'm going in there. Don't go there, don't go there, but you reach in the compound, everything you see is violent. Children being beaten, the insults being thrown left and right. And the one thing that every time I walk over there that comes to mind is that, my Lord, we have a whole new population of perpetrators, the children of these people. And this is the situation we see in South Africa. Those who went through that violent apartheid regime, who have lived and had children, who never was never really taught the history of why they have this thing. Because most times, people continue to have this victimization story. And then young people grow up with this bitterness. I never really had X, Y, Z because my parents were treated this way. And since they can't get to those people who they want to get to, so they try it out on people who are close to them. We see this happening in many communities. And I think, they, like I said, psychosocial healing. This is the role of schools. This is the role of the church. This is the role of government. But it is not just a government situation. It is a situation of, you, you are from South Africa. You go to Cape Town. You go to Joburg. You go to the black communities in South Africa. And what you see there is, is, is just like um, tragedy ready to happen. It, it, it's, it's a moving train of tragic events. Alcoholism, drug abuse, you go into the mall, young people are having withdrawal symptoms and begging for money. It's because no one has taken all time. So you have this generation of trauma just moving from one generation to the other. And it's something that not one activist group can do. It, it needs a holistic um, approach in dealing with that particular problem. Any other question? I like it when people are shy. OK, sir. Uh, you mentioned the role of the church. I wondered between the various countries you work in uh, if you see differences um, in the role of the church and the Christian churches in those countries and or any other religious institutions in those countries and how that might help or hurt the problems you're talking about. You know, one of the things that I've noticed in countries that have gone through crisis, there is a quick alliance forged between the Christian church and the Islamic body. For example, in Liberia, for many years, they had something called the Interreligious Council. These were the people who would speak up and say, this is the way we should go. Liberia never degenerated into a crisis of religious with, an, with a religious undertone because the Interreligious Council insisted that we all want people regardless of how you pray. In some countries, um, you go to, like for example, Nigeria, today you have the Boko Haram. And everyone links them to the Islamic faith. But, and they go into churches, commit atrocities, and sometimes communities get fed up. But one of the reasons why Nigeria, with one of the heaviest population of Christian and Muslim, have not degenerated into a civil war or a religious war is the voice of reasoning from the highest in the church to the highest in the Islamic um, council. You find that happening. I, I've never really been to a place in my work, especially in West Africa and parts of Africa where 
either the church or the, 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 the Muslim body has been agitating and has been the, the main cause for conflict. Let me be honest, as a Christian, sometimes I think the Christians try. For example, in Liberia for many years, even to our law say we're a circular nation, but there's not one Islamic holiday that is celebrated as a national holiday in Liberia. But all of the Christian holidays are celebrated. So the, the Muslims go to parliament and say, at least one day, and the Christian gets up and say they want to make our nation an Islamic nation. Then you, you get them going and saying parliament should declare Liberia a Christian state in this day and age. Why would you be asking for something like that when your country? So sometimes it's, even when I work with the women, we had a coalition of Christian and Muslim women. People ask me all the time, so who are the most difficult to deal with? I say, trust me, the Christian women. Because they will wake up one morning and see vision. And the Lord say that what fellowship does darkness have with light? And we have to clarify, yes, darkness has no fellowship with light. But when we're looking for peace, both light and darkness can come together to make blur and bring peace. You know, but we, our most difficult, our biggest challenge for me as a Christian was working with the Christian women because they had all of the scriptural references to back not having a coalition with Muslim people. On the other hand, I don't know, maybe because they are the minority, the women, the Muslim women were bending backwards over to accommodate some of the discomfort. But to really say we've gone into countries and say, you will see sects, groups coming up and saying this, but at the national level, there will be a quick coming together of all of those groups saying, we can't have that here. That's, that has been my experience. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, what is your message to the young women here at Barnard who are so fortunate to have this great educational experience and can't even begin to imagine what the young women in Libya are going through um, right now? Make the most of it. You know, sometimes it's so easy to take things for granted when you've never really been to that side that I'm looking at. You know that side, you haven't seen it. Don't take anything for granted, make use of every opportunity. You know, no matter how crazy an instructor may look, unstylish, you know, she doesn't have a swag. <laughs> She's not cool, but she has something to offer you. There's always learning, there's always something to learn you also have to remember that because there are a whole generation of people who do not have this opportunity, I'm not just doing it for me. I'm doing it for a whole generation of women to follow after me. Who would have told me after four children that going to college will impact the world? No one would have told me that. You know, it's, it's, it's and, and, and for kids in this country, I'm not saying I know all of your situation, but I know some, because I, like I said, I have nieces. And it's, it's, it's easy for you to complain. This is not working, I don't have this, and it's, I think, oh, and my mom is so this, and, and trust me, girl. There are so many young people out there who just wish for the presence of an annoying mother. <laughs> there are so many young people who are out there who just wish for a mother that they can pick up the telephone. Like my daughter would tell me, I have a 15-year-old who thinks she is the smartest feminist in the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would say things like, Pooh, don't you know, she was coming to New Hampshire to school. Don't fall in love with no blue-eyed white boy. And she would look at me like, Mama, and the world listens to you? <laughs> but as annoying as we can be, we got your back. As annoying as we can be, that we're providing the kind of education that we're providing for you is something for you to be grateful for. 
One of the things that you constantly hear in this part of the world, I did it, I made it, I worked hard. There is no I, it's we. Even if you studied, even if you read those books, but this weekend, when they could be having date nights for those who are married, they are here with you. When they could be having some girlfriend time, they are here with you. And I've taken off my Nobel laureate and I'm speaking to you all as a mother. Don't take anything for granted. Make use, absorb every learning there is to, to have in the space called Barnard. And step out an empowered woman mm -hmm. with your head up high, saying to yourself, I am going to make a difference in the world, not for me, but for my sisters. Whether she's black, Indian, Chinese, African, Mexican, I am out here to learn to go out there and make a difference. This is all you need to do. Because if you don't, when life decides to throw you some blows, you will sit and wonder, where the hell did my life go? I can stand here because at one point, there was a circle of people who supported me back to school after four children who held my hand, who worked with me, who helped me. And I took every learning. I worked in one office for free for one year. I did everything to the point that they would give me money. I would bring it back. My boss would use every penny, and he would tell me, report for every bit of this money that I've eaten. And I would look at him like, are you serious? I could get in trouble for this write this report, do this, and when it came to doing monthly report, I would do the report, give it, you would send it back to me. Push your brain. I didn't mind pushing my brain. Today, that boss cannot even call himself my professional colleague, because he's not. He played. He wasted his years. Don't be like that. Absorb, learn, engage. Take everything, mm -hmm. because you never know which learning will be important for your future. And be grateful to your parents, because sometimes those of us who have you smarty pants called teenagers, <laughs> the air that you put out is most times ingratitude, mm -hmm. because you're in my business. You want to rule my life. You want to do this. Man, mom, you're such a headache. And right now, I'm thinking about my own children. I'm having nightmares, because that's what they say. And your friends will say, we want to come home with you, and they would say, she's crazy. she wake up at 5 AM and call Jesus' name till 7. But make, take good use. Make good use of everything. Think about how many young people who wish they were in your space. Let me conclude and tell you the story of the girls that I have, few of them on my scholarship at the foundation. One is called Miata Famule. And Miata was brought to us by a group of community women. And they said to me, help her. I said, why should I help her? We don't have money. And one of the women said, Lima, you will find the money. Meata's mother is insane. And she has two younger brothers. She wants to be a doctor. She wakes up at 3 AM every morning, makes bread. And she sells in the community till 5.30. Get those boys ready for school. And then she gets ready get on the local motorcycle, and it's about an hour from where she lives to the university where she's studying chemistry and biology. So when we took her into the program, I told her, since this is a serious hassle and we do everything, 
Let's send you to one of the private universities where you'll be a boarding student, and you don't have to struggle as you're struggling. With tears in her eyes, she said to me, I wish I could say yes. But if I take that, who's going to take care of my mother and my brothers? Recently, we had to introduce something called financial aid to augment school fees. Every other thing we're doing, we, we had to introduce giving cash to Miata. Yvonne lost both of her parents to pancreatic cancer. She works full time in the office cleaning, my office cleaning and scrubbing. Very timid, quiet young woman. We have her on a scholarship and she comes with that 3.5, 3.4. But without the $60 that we pay Yvonne every month, she won't have anything to feed herself. Josephine, the only daughter of 13 children and can only go to university because we sent her, just came back from Canada. And she sat in that room and said to me, I never ever expected to cross the border to Guinea, let alone go to Canada. Madam Bowie, the God that I serve will bless you for the rest of your life. I can go on recounting the story of girls like yourself, your age, with no hope of going to school. Had they not encountered us, they will be married, some will be in villages, but today, one of them just graduated from nursing school and she's on her way to Indianapolis to do her master's in nursing, courtesy of the University of Indianapolis. But she was so shy, her voice could never come out. One day I saw her all dressed up, and I called her Nurse Iwu. Nurse Iwu, you look so different. She said, Madam Bowie, you will never know what it is to be going to school and not worry about where your school fees comes from. It's so easy to take for granted. But if you ever try to be ungrateful to your mother, your instructor, or anyone else, remember those girls. And that's just one part of Africa. You have Asia and other places. I'm not saying you have it all. What I'm saying to you is make the best of the best that you have. Thank you. Bowie, we thank you for your words. On behalf of our students, on behalf of our families, we are thrilled to have you in our community. Your presentation today, you said, would be reflections on joining the Barnard family. We are honored to have you amongst the Barnard family. Thank you so much.